We've called this series Meeting Our Moment. And so wherever you are, I hope you'll enjoy meeting these remarkable people and meeting our moment through them. Natalie Carnes is Associate Professor of Theology at Baylor University in Texas. She's established herself as one of the finest and most original voices in contemporary theology. Original, not because she tries to start from scratch, but because she tackles traditional theological themes in unusual ways. Her most recent book, entitled Motherhood, a Confession, weaves together Augustine's classic confessions with her own experience as a mother. Her interest in theology and the arts is especially evident in her first two books, Beauty, a theological engagement with Gregory of Nyssa, and Image and Presence, a Christological reflection on iconoclasm and iconophilia. Here she rethinks ancient themes, like beauty and the role of images in Christianity, but in ways that directly engage contemporary lived experience. And that's what struck me most of all in my conversation with her. Here is someone deeply rooted in the classics of the past, while also being acutely sensitive to our own present cultural moment. For doing this, um, I mean, let me say, uh, Natalie, I just love the motherhood book. I was reading it this morning, um, savoring its eloquence um, in my favorite coffee shop. A lot of people were looking at me, wondering what on earth I was reading that was you know, grasping them so much. A question I had here towards the end, have you ever written any poetry? Because as I read that, um, it doesn't read to me so much like a novel. It reads to me, well, a certain kind of novel, anyhow. It reads to me much more like someone who is attuned to the music of words, to the flow of a paragraph, to indwelling a metaphor and letting it do its, do its work fearlessly um all of things i associate with a very good poet so do you sort of secretly retire two in the morning somewhere and write poetry and not tell anyone about it um if i did could i admit that here <laughs> no i think that i i've i guess i think theology for me is a is a is a kind of poetry and prayer is a kind of poetry um and I don't, I don't know if I'll traffic more in um, more sort of artistic works like novels. I, motherhood and creative nonfiction might be as artistic as I get. Um, but I think that I'm really drawn to theologians who write their theology as a kind of art. I think too often in theology, yeah. we are, we're trained to just get ideas out there. Yeah, um, not attend to theological writing as itself a craft. And so I guess I see, well, that's my craft and I'm going to work and teaching as a craft. And I am trying to work on developing and learning those kinds of crafts. Of course, we live in the midst of a global pandemic, also an economic crisis that has yet to work itself out fully. And the consequences for uh, the already disadvantaged uh, look catastrophic. And in the U.S. especially, to a fierce awareness of racial injustice, but here in the U.K. also. It would be the most natural reaction in such times to say, how can we possibly justify a luxury like the arts in the midst of all this? Now, I know this is something you've been thinking about and writing about before these very recent turns of events. Um, and I've heard you focus on the scene, that wonderful scene in the Gospels. In, in Matthew's version, I think it's, it's a woman pouring perfume on Jesus' feet and the disciples protest, uh, why this waste? You must have been thinking even more about these things recently. Particularly now, where you're right, I think that there is this intensification of this tension in Christianity between our calling to... Um, feed the hungry, slake the thirsty, shelter the unsheltered, and then also this sort of constant impulse throughout Christianity to also build beautiful altars and places of worship, and how do we sort of negotiate that tension? It's a tension that has been in Christianity since the beginning, and as yeah. you mentioned, there's even a loc locus in scripture for thinking about it. 
in a way that puts, um, makes an interesting contrast with the way that Peter Singer deals with it. So Peter yep. Singer um, has this way of approaching the world called effective altruism, where you donate money to the places that are going to be the best at ameliorating need, reducing death. And it thinks of the world pr principally in those terms, physical need and reduction of death um, or of early death. And um, Christianity comes interestingly close to that in the urgency with which um, scripture and Christian thinkers over the centuries talk about poverty. Mm. And yet it's also held this place for the arts at the same time. And I think you start to see how, how that tension sort of abides in Christianity precisely in the scenes that you mentioned. So you have right before the anointing, the Matthew 25 scene, verses 31 through 46, where you have Jesus offering this view of those he calls the least of the members of my family, um, which seems to make attending to those kinds of needs of hunger and unsheltered the most important thing. He basically separates the sheep from the goats based on who has been yeah. Um, yeah. forming these corporal acts of mercy. You know, he says, it's whatever you've done to the least of these members of my family, you've done unto me. And they, so the disciples must have, I, I sort of picture them coming away from that moment where they're like, well, this is the most important thing. This is how the sheep are separated from the goats based yeah. on corporal acts of mercy. Yeah. So that's what we're called to do. But you just sort of turn the corner into Matthew 26. And the next scene with the disciples, they're at the home um, of Simon the leper in Bethany. And the woman's unnamed in Matthew. Um, but she comes and anoints Jesus with an alabaster jar of expensive ointment. And the disciples, who have just, in this narrative, processed the lesson that he gave them in Matthew 25, are like, hey, 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 what's this woman doing? Jesus, why this? waste. Mm. And Jesus sort of holds them off and he says several things, but among them, he sort of ends his speech with, you know, wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the good news is given, it will be done in memory of this woman. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it sort of points to, well, okay, so the kind of corporal mercy that Christians are called to is not exactly the same as effective altruism. So yeah. how is it different? And I think what Jesus is doing here is that he's presenting actually a radical critique of the disciples' understanding of, of what waste is, and that wasting is not these lavish acts of worship, but wasting is instead treating as disposable. Right. Uh, wasting is something that we do to creation and we do to the world. It's not something that creation ever is. Right. Yeah, indeed. Can you give some examples of that kind of waste? Absolutely. So, um, I mean, we see this kind of waste both in, um, you can find it, of course, in the ways that we treat the creation as disposable in terms of our, the way that we live and our environmental impact and the way that we just literally dispose of things and the way we live in a culture of disposability in which we continually replace new consumer goods, but then also in the way that we treat people as disposable and yep. that we treat their labor as disposable and in yep. the way that the disciples end up you know, they're so focused on addressing need that they ignore the need of the woman pouring the alabaster right in front of their eyes, right? Yeah, that yeah. Something Indeed. that that act is expressing of gratitude and sorrow and worship. In the Christian tradition, of course, this, this well, this tradition of asceticism. And uh, it's, you, in, in one of your writings, you make a distinction between two types of asceticism because you must want to affirm, nonetheless, a type of asceticism. So talk about the difference, if you can, between those two. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's, there are many forms of asceticism in our culture, but I think Singer points to an, an interesting asceticism that is in some ways deeply attractive, especially to young and idealistic people, where you give up everything in your life above what you need to survive and make a difference in the world's need and that you give all of the rest of it away and right. give it away to address bare physical need. And this is one vision of asceticism that's oriented towards need. And then there's another vision of asceticism that's deep in Christianity where it's um, an asceticism that it always uh, is oriented towards feasting. It's oriented towards feasting both in like the way that you know, Lent is oriented towards Easter, Advent towards Christmas, um, but also is oriented towards this 
eschatological feast of yeah. the the wedding banquet, the supper of the lamb, yeah, yeah. and and the the way that this shifts our orientation of our asceticism is not that it's less demanding, but it changes the way that we're approaching the world and the people who people who live in need. Is it fair to say then that asceticism, properly understood, is less about giving up, but more that giving for, giving to? Yes, absolutely. There's this kind of relationality or this kinship that's at the heart of asceticism, um, and I think that. You know, Pope Francis talks about this a lot in his Laudato yeah. Si, the kind of kinship, yeah. and he's drawing on St. Francis, of course, who um, talks about the whole world, all of creation with this kinship of like a brother sun and sister moon and um, all of creation is something that we live in, in kinship to and relationality to, and that that's what our asceticism is oriented to, is towards a renewal of our relationships with one another and yeah. the world, not as a series of problems to be solved, which ends up making people who live in need intolerable, right? Because they're a constant reminder of our yeah. of our failure to be able to address need. They become only problems to be solved. Yeah, exactly. little else, a little else. Yeah. Very reductive, in other words, yeah. Fascinating. We come back now to the art. As yes. I understand it, you want to say something to the effect that, that there's something excessive, extravagant, surplus to requirement in the arts and those, just by virtue of the way they operate. Yes. And that, that, is a, that is one issue, and the other issue is, well, how are we actually using these arts, which may be in a very bad way. Could you say more about what that quality is about the arts? You think that's kind of almost like a built-in excessiveness. For something, to name something as art is to name the way that it exceeds its own objecthood. Yeah. Um, the way it sort of signifies something beyond its own literal existence. That's, and it's something that sort of captures our attention in some way. And in this way, it's, I think it's like a visual analog of what sacraments do. Obviously, they're not sacraments, yep. but the way that sacraments are like these distilled versions of reality, bread and wine, that draw us more deeply into the divine life, not because they're less creation or they're less real, yep. but because they're more creation. They're kind of more. density or concentration. Constantly. Exactly, yep. a density. Yep. And art is not that, but it sort of gives us a, a visual picture. But then the other part of what you say is, is also true, that that doesn't mean arts can't get caught up in structures of exploitation and domination yeah. and disability. They can just the same as everything else can in the world. So they, even though structurally they offer us this opportunity to recognize what creation is and how to live within it, particular arts can also betray that structure. That's great. Iconoclasm is again something you've written about. Yes. And to state the obvious, it's happening in America. It's certainly happening in this country as well. Yes. I mean, at Oxford, yes. up, up the road, yes. um, the, the Statue of Rhodes, you know, and the, um, the slave trader in Bristol as well. So mm -hmm. there's that. This is an impulse we associate, well, with all sorts of things, but not least a certain kind of Protestantism. So particularly in the Protestant tradition, but I reckon it probably takes it forms in many different traditions. Um, you have the interesting thesis that there's a kind of iconoclasm or image breaking within making images in a kind of paradoxical way. Could you explain that? Well, so I'll just point to the way that colloquially we do this all the time where we yeah. talk about an iconoclastic artist yeah. and we mean an artist that is sort of challenging or breaking, transgressing some kind of cultural value or ideal. Um, and one of the interesting places where this was used um, in the religious world was when Pope Francis washed the feet of a Muslim woman on his first Maundy Thursday as Pope. And that was called an iconoclastic act. And obviously there's nothing physical that's destroyed in that act, but it was sort of breaking a kind of norm or expectation that people had about what the Pope would do on a Monday, Thursday service and whose feet he would wash. So I think that there, um, that images themselves can be iconoclastic in that way. But also what images are is that they're always pointing beyond themselves and in this way sort of negating their literal existence in order to point to the image so that yeah. there's a kind of intrinsic breaking or negation to what an image is and how it works. When you say, just to interrupt, sorry, but you say breaking the literal, yes. do you mean just breaking the concrete or do you mean breaking a notion of literal reference? What, what does literal mean there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I think it can, it operates at several levels. Like one is just 
to look at uh, an image of wood and paint is to have your attention drawn beyond the wood and paint yeah. to what it is that it's trying to create. Yeah. Um, but then also Christian images often operate at multiple levels of yeah. literal that they're moving beyond. So, you know, um, I'm interested in this sort of tradition of images of, of Mary breastfeeding Jesus, uh-huh. where um, they interact with the viewer in all these fascinating kinds of ways. A lot of them, in order, they they function as kinds of invitations to the viewer to feed with Christ on Mary, yeah. who's a figure of the church. Yeah, yeah. There's, there can be... Uh, depending on the image can have multiple levels of literal that it's working against, but just as an image, it's working against its just its material existence. It's pointing beyond its material existence to a prototype or an image. Yeah. And when we look at like ma- the kinds of material iconoclasms we're dealing with now, um, I think it actually makes a lot of sense as a way of dealing with the Confederate statues. These were statues that are literally hollow like they they went up very quickly they don't have a lot of meaning except in order to enforce and police a kind of white supremacy during the Jim Crow South Mm. um and so I mean I think the their physical hollowness kind of is points to their ideological hollowness it's really just this one it's not like um most images have this sort of plurality of meaning these images are hollow with meaning. Um, And this wave of iconoclasm, it makes sense. I do think it's interesting the ways that, um, as I mentioned before, um, the way that people create selfies and stuff with this because they need an image. What's important is the image of the statue coming down and the revelation of its hollowness, the way that it twists and crumbles as it falls, and the way that you can sort of pose with this vanquished statue. So um, what replaces them is not nothing. It's these kinds of images of destruction. But then I think, well, we're moving into another era now where we have more complicated statues. You know, what do we do with statues of um, slaveholders like George Washington, our first president? And we need to address it. Um, And we need to, and we can address it with a kind of Wittgensteinian iconoclasm is part of what I... um, So what would that look like in the case of, say, the Washington... Or or Churchill in London would be another example, wouldn't it? Exactly. So, well, I mean, when I first started thinking about this, it was because I heard an interview several years ago with a a civil rights activist, Andrew Young. Yes. Talking about Stone Mountain, Mm. where they have, it's like the the Mount Rushmore of Confederate um, leaders. And he said, what if instead of just tearing down Stone Mountain as if it never happened, we um, put a Liberty Bell there? Yeah. in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. statement, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain. And the Liberty Bell would signify to us the hope that freedom would ring even from the most racist and unfree parts of our country. And I thought, well, that's a really powerful way of recognizing the past in terms of its deep evils yeah. and trying to move it forward into a way. And I thought, well, this is actually a call for artists, right? Yeah. We need artists right. who can help us imagine what to do with these statues of George Washington and all the rest, because we're caught right now. You can see it in our political rhetoric. It's coming up all the time. My husband's constantly sending me articles. And he's like, look at this, look at this. You should write mm. something. But um, mm. where you have these two polarities of either take down the statues or leave them up that those are the two options that we have. And then maybe there's like this idea of putting up a historical plaque to contextualize it. But the historical plaque, all it does is sort of slightly mitigate the power of the statue. And what I wonder would be a better option is instead a kind of iconoclastic art that is helping to reinterpret what it is George Washington has meant and should mean and our country how it wants to position its relationship to George Washington moving forward. So I don't know, maybe it would involve um, artists imagining, you know, Ona um, sort of facing George Washington and confronting him in his statues. Maybe it would involve um, kinds of creative drawing on civil rights iconography, maybe iconography from Black Lives Matter in order to help us reimagine what these statues and what our past should mean for us. So there seems to be a double thing in that. The one, is the destabilizing, we might call the critical, on the one hand, but as well as another, you're looking forward to something more constructive. Yes. Is that right? I mean, that's certainly the case with the Andrew Young thing. Well, Natalie, you've attuned us to a whole lot of 
things and new things. I always learn a great deal from you. So our sincere thanks to you and very best wishes for, for all your all your coming projects. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you.